It's wonderful to see everyone this morning or this afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, the, the talk I'm going to give today is really summarizing uh, a bunch of different studies and some early lessons from the COVID-19 pandemic and its impact on uh, patients and survivors and also on the health systems. And I've kind of pulled together a few different studies that are underway here um, with some of the collaborators, including Helen and Colleen, who is on this call as well, and Christina Jenai and, and Ryan Woods, who are, are good colleagues here in BC. So first off, um, I am based at Simon Fraser, BC Cancer and at ARC, and uh, I want to acknowledge that we get to live and work on uh, unceded territories of the Coastal Salish peoples, that's the Sahelwatooth, Coquitlam, Squamish and Musqueam nations. Um, a couple of declarations, I currently sit on the BC Ministry of Health Lifetime Prevention Schedule Expert Committee, and I'm a member of the board for Inspire Health, which is a non-profit integrated cancer care provider. This is a, uh, a diagram that I think everyone on this call will be very familiar with. Um, in BC in particular, we have a very rapidly aging population, which is driving uh, growth in our number of incident cases of cancer. We are hoping to open two new cancer centers in the next decade or so. We know we have a very large growth in incident cases coming our way. And then, of course, we had COVID-19. Um, it's kind of interesting talking to some of the ADMs about how this rolled out. Um, some of the, the different uh, drug plan managers and people involved with um, rolling out pandemic response talk about January, um, sorry, December 31st, New Year's Eve uh, on 2019, when they started getting uh, messages of uh, a, a, an imminent severe public health threat due to the COVID-19 outbreak uh, in China at that time. And that a growing recognition at that point that this was uh, going to spread very rapidly and globally. And this is uh, just a graph from wave one from David Patrick, who led a lot of the uh, BCCDC work here in BC. And it gives a nice breakdown of the gradual ramp up of public health restrictions that happened. And, and a lot of the big things happened here in BC anyway, around March 16, 17, 18 and 20. Uh, and I put this up because it, it uh, dovetails nicely with some of the other data I'm going to show you. Um, as you're probably aware, in the first wave, BC was quite fortunate. And we, part of that is just sheer luck. And it was just due to timing of uh, spring break, which clobbered uh, Quebec and Ontario harder than, than we, us in BC. Um, we didn't fare as well in some of the later waves, but uh, we were fortunate in some respects here in, in this part of the world anyway, with the way wave one rolled out. So let me start with patients and families, and I'm going to start with someone that, that uh, a number of you will know quite well, Robin McGee. And I reached out to Robin because when I was writing the initial talk, uh, and I gave this as a CADIS lecture earlier in the year, uh, some of this stuff, uh, it, it happened that Robin was tweeting at the time about her personal experiences and I reached out to her and uh, she was very gracious in, in uh, allowing me to tell a bit of her story during, uh, during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And this is Robin, March 19, you see this coincides even though she's not in, in BC, but it coincides with uh, the real start of our restrictions in wave one. I picked a bad time to get cancer again. Cancer recurrence during COVID-19 uh, is uh, a, a real challenge for her. And she ties this into the work that she's been doing as an advocate for a long time now. She's feeling on March 22nd that she's waking up in a Salvador Dali painting. And then um, she has an adverse reaction to some of the treatment that she's getting and there's a real threat of her going blind. But because of pandemic restrictions uh, around surgery in Nova Scotia, um, there's a problem in the sense that her surgery is postponed or canceled. And in the end, through lobbying, through herself and some of her friends and colleagues, she managed to get uh, some surgery, but she'd have to pay for it at a private clinic was the initial reaction. And then later on, we're back into chemotherapy for her. And by October the 1st, she's saying today's my birthday, uh, but October was the last month, uh, was the month I would have been legally blind if she hadn't have had that delayed surgery. Uh, and you can see her book here. But the, the thing that jumped out to me, and this is when I was writing the talk for, for Cadeth earlier this year, was um, 
just at this time, Robin posted my recent MRI shows my cancer grew by 45% during the months my treatment was delayed. Uh, and obviously that is uh, a very sad personal event, uh, but it's also very illustrative of some of the challenges that our patients have been facing during the pandemic because of all the delays and disruptions we've experienced in Canada across the country. So I'm turning now again to an organization that a number of you will be very familiar with and the Canadian Cancer Survivor Network. Um, and they produced three surveys of patient experiences in Canada throughout the pandemic. And they've actually just kind of amalgamated it into one report, uh, which will be very helpful. Uh, and they've done some really tremendous work here surveying uh, uh, patients, survivors and family members about their experiences. So I wanted to share some of their data from the third survey they did. Um, and here it is here. So this is um, uh, in some of the later waves of COVID that we got. Uh, and when they surveyed patients, caregivers and people uh, who they, they classified as being pre-diagnosis, they're on that diagnostic journey, if you like. Um, although slightly less than the, the last wave, half of patients uh, continue to have their appointments cancelled, postponed, or rescheduled. Um, and, and more than half of the caregivers are finding that their appointments are postponed or rescheduled. So that's quite a significant impact in terms of moving around appointments, consultations, and the like. And there are further delays you can see there in labs, diagnostics, uh, avoided visiting an ER when they might have otherwise chosen to visit an ER, and then surgeries and procedures cancelled. One of the telling things we see here, and I'm going to show some US data uh, later on or talk about it, is the impact on caregivers and patients. And the caregivers actually have uh, reported very, very significant impacts of, of COVID-19, um, both on kind of attending consultations, but also in terms of psychosocial well-being. So moving on uh, in terms of experiencing delays uh, in starting or continuing treatment, we've seen some improvement in this as the waves have gone on. We've got, we've got slightly better in terms of fewer people are experiencing delays in starting or continuing treatment. Uh, at the start of the, the pandemic wave one, this number was much larger. Uh, and I'm gonna go on and show some, uh, some uh, data from Tim Hanna later that talks about what the impact of a delay in treatment is on patient outcomes. And this is something that really interests me because I, I think we uh, underplay the mental health impacts of cancer. Uh, we spend too much time on, on the biology uh, and treating the biology of the disease and, and, and the physical symptoms, not enough time uh, looking at some of the psychosocial impact. And I'm hoping that one of the things that comes out of the pandemic is, is a little bit of a reorientation to, um, uh, to recognize these psychosocial issues that, that come up with cancer patients and survivors. And you can see in the top part of the table there, the main reasons for avoiding booking an appointment with a doctor. Um, and a lot of these are patient or caregiver driven uh, in terms of having concerns around exposure to COVID-19. Everyone I know who has been a primary caregiver with a, uh, a, an unwell partner or family member during the pandemic, everyone has been really concerned about bringing COVID-19 into the home or into a, a care setting and infecting others who may be more vulnerable or susceptible. So there's a real issue there about uh, avoiding uh, exposure. And at the bottom is the part around mental health, psychosocial wellbeing. Patients are reporting a, a very significant uh, impact on, on mental health, but caregivers more so. And this seems to be something that's borne out in international data as well, that the caregivers, and, and this is one of the things about being a caregiver, sometimes uh, around locus of control and things like that, you don't feel as in control, you feel a little bit helpless. Um, certainly very high levels of anxiety, stress, worry, all those mental health type of uh, domains of quality of life. I'm turning now, there, that was some great Canadian data and I wanted to focus on, on Canada mainly today, but this was a really good survey that came out in the US really early on in the, the pandemic after wave one or in the middle of wave one, 
and there's lots of great data. It's an ASCO survey. And they say here, one in four US adults say routine cancer screening tests have been delayed or canceled because of the pandemic. And in some respects, we haven't yet untangled the impact on treatment as well as we have on screening. And I think it's to do with simplicity of measurements. Uh, my gut feeling is looking at the data we have so far, the impact on screening has been very significant. But what's interesting about this diagram is that if you look on the right hand side, the reason for uh, skipping or delaying or changing your screening test, more of it was coming or the largest category was coming from patients or uh, members of the public who were rearranging their tests rather than the provider. And this is speaking to, and in this case, screening a well person trying to avoid contact, uh, potential exposure to COVID-19 and potentially exposing other people to it. But we need to unpack when we look at all the knock-on effects of COVID-19, we need to unpack uh, where there were provider delays, where there were patient delays and address some of those challenges because I think we, we have a good feel that there are still a lot of people who are worried about exposure to COVID-19 and are delaying healthcare because of it. Um, just some international data here. UK, they found there was a 6% reduction of patients presenting to primary care with cancer symptoms. We've got a number of uh, clinicians on the phone. I think every uh, on, on the line today, I think everyone I know is saying the same things, that they're seeing people present later uh, and there may be stage shift for some of these. A uh, population-based survey in Spain found that individuals were taking longer to get to their primary care provider when they were symptomatic. Um, so this is a, a broad international phenomenon that we're seeing. And uh, um, earlier on in this year, the, the American Association for Cancer Research produced a report as well. And some of this report's very good, but I'm gonna be a bit critical of some of the data later on. Um, this was looking about COVID-19 in patients with cancer. Um, they were reporting in their data that hospitalization rates for COVID-19 patients with cancer were about double those uh, without cancer. Uh, so that's obviously quite a significant, just from eyeballing the data, quite a large difference. And the mortality rate was higher in cancer patients with COVID-19 compared to those without. The problem with these data, uh, and I'll talk more about this later on, is in terms of confounding. So this was fairly early data that's reported here. Um, we've got some systematic reviews underway with an international group that I'll touch on. Uh, one of the things they found in, we found in the, the early data, the early studies, um, a lot of them didn't in, include uh, adequate controls. They didn't include adequate kind of case mix classifications. So we have some data that suggests things might be going on, but our degree of certainty to which our evidence is really good at the moment, we're, we're not as clear on. That will take time to um, get well-designed studies. And, and here's a great example, actually, on the next slide, predictor of mortalities in patients with cancer and COVID-19. And the AACR produced this table, you know, you know, male, older, smoke, all kinds of things there. And these are all highly plausible predictors of mortality in patients with cancer and COVID-19, but we don't yet have uh, complete data, and it will be a while yet to really tease out whether these are this is high quality evidence or whether this is uh, stuff that's been confounded and we're looking at more observational data. So I would take this as preliminary uh, and we'll see what the, the better designed long-term studies show us as well. Um, and again, here's some, some preliminary findings from this report on how patient, patients might respond to vaccines. Uh, so those with solid tumors and prior COVID-19 infection, uh, the, the data so far is suggesting that you get a higher antibody response. Those with hematologic malignancies, stem cell transplant, CAR T therapy, lower antibody response. And there's certainly some biological plausibility to that type of thing. But uh, again, we, we are still working on studies on that. And not surprisingly, there's a whole bunch of international studies going on right now looking at uh, health related behaviors during the pandemic. And um, we are all well aware that this, uh, the pandemic had quite a, a big impact on behaviors, uh, mental, mental health and the like. 
um, we're starting to see uh, quite a lot of data showing that alcohol intake and things like smoking may have increased um, due to stress and anxiety during the, the pandemic. Again, lots of longer term work going on here. Financial concerns, it depends on where you are in the country, in Canada, about how much this would have affected you. But uh, of course, as we know in the US, there's a much bigger impact uh, on patients in terms of who, who don't have good insurance status. Uh, and uh, we're seeing already some data showing increased anxiety and financial concerns. We have uh, this social phenomenon, and uh, my training is as a social scientist, so I always find this fascinating. We've got health phenomenon, we've got social phenomenon. So we've got lots of people who were laid off, uh, typically in service sector industries who don't have high incomes and who don't have health insurance most of the time. So there's a, a, a social science phenomenon going on with a, a health phenomenon at the same time. Um, and, and I think we'll see kind of lots of multiplicative effects on some of the people in lower income in the US. And I'm going to turn now to health systems. Uh, and I'm going to talk a lot about screening and about treatment, because these are where we're seeing some of the bigger impacts. We actually, at the moment, there's been a, a bunch of good studies coming out. And there's some of the co-authors or authors on this Zoom call looking at different parts of the trajectory and perhaps have spent more time on the survivorship end of the continuum. So if they, they, there may be some interesting comments come out of that as well. The, the work I'm going to try and summarize um, is more focused on the, the screening diagnosis treatment uh, part of this uh, trajectory. So this is where uh, I, I want to highlight the work of colleagues uh, around the world uh, in the COVID-19 and, and Cancer Global Modeling Consortium. This is a, a consortium led by Karen Canfell in Sydney um, with uh, people all across the world. We have ARC is involved with this. We have IARC, we have the UICC, CPAC and various people. Started out mainly as a modeling exercise with COVID very early on. Um, with a desire internationally to pull together people with models for various different types of cancers to try and help mitigate the impact of COVID-19 on cancer systems. And it's turned into a very large undertaking um, and it's a terrific group of people that we're working with there. I'm very happy to be part of this. Uh, and it, broadly speaking, the work that's going on internationally is, is uh, split up into three uh, working groups. Um, cancer working group one is looking at changes in, in cancer outcomes and also changes in cancer detection and cancer staging. Uh, and working group three is looking at uh, biological impact on risk and the effect of risky behaviors. And I've just mentioned, you know, smoking and alcohol intake and things like that. So we kind of have this diagram with the, the, the different types of impacts that are all working with each other, impact on cancer risk, delays in diagnosis, and potentially decrease survival in the longer term. So the really big impacts we've seen have been in screening and early detection. Um, and I wanted to come up with an analogy to try and, and, and uh, capture the problem here. Uh, and the, the closest thing I've come up with is the Mariana Trench, which is the deepest part of the ocean. And you can see here that the, the kind of topography of the Mariana Trench, you're underwater, you fall down the trench, um, the trench is almost as deep as Mount Everest. You try and climb back out, but it's a nice analogy because you're still underwater by the time you try and come out of this, this trench that you're in. And it turns out that this trench, and you can see it up there in the right-hand corner, looks an awful lot like what happened to our screening volumes during the pandemic and especially in wave one. So these are data that Megan Walker uh, published last year uh, for the screening programs in Ontario. And you can see here that you have uh, a drop off in screening almost to zero around April, May and June of last year, and then starting to climb back up again. And on the left hand side, we have population based mammography. On the right hand side, we have the high risk uh, people with uh, familial history, BRCA1, BRCA2 mutations who get mammography and MRI. What's important about the Mariana Trench problem here is, and we'll see that this is common to lots of jurisdictions, 
On the left-hand side, the population screening program, there was this big dip down where we shut down a lot of our screening because we weren't sure of our exposure to an unknown pathogen, and then a gradual climb back out again. But by the end of that year, hadn't quite returned to normal screening volumes. The good news is, uh, and I'll tell you why this is good news, in the high risk groups, they'd gone above what they expected to do by the end of the year. So there's catch up going on. And that turns out to be tremendously important. I should say this is data for 2020. We feel reasonably confident in most jurisdictions in Canada that we're pretty close now to normal screening volumes, uh, at least in the last few months. Omicron, of course, changed things again. But a big dip down there. And if you go to the colorectal screening programs, left-hand side, you see the population-based colorectal screening program. Same thing, Mariana Trench dipped down, come back up, still not back up to uh, volumes that you saw before the pandemic. But with the increased risk, so Lynch syndrome, high-risk people, you're seeing uh, um, a, a big jump back up again, much closer to what we would expect with, without the presence of a pandemic. So all kinds of good findings in this paper in terms of understanding what's going on. Uh, a 41% fewer tests delivered in 2020 compared to 2019. So just a staggering change uh, in the amount of screens done. Um, then some catch up and then some data around abnormal call rate. Um, about 11% uh, less people received a confirmed diagnosis within seven week period compared to 2019 for population based, uh, population risk depressed uh, individuals. So um, that's quite a significant drop in terms of the, the fewer people re receiving a confirmed diagnosis. I put this slide in because I thought this was really interesting because health equity is front and center in anything to do with COVID-19. And again, the, there are very few silver linings from a pandemic, but there are some. And one of the silver linings I think we've got here, in addition to highlighting mental health, uh, we have a silver lining that has really helped push forward health equity on the agenda. We were already doing a lot and we had a number of, uh, you know, social science type events that helped push forward um, health equity. But COVID-19 has really shown us that this hits the the the, the more disadvantaged, much harder than the, the, the better off. And this study showed the same thing. Older adults and those from low income neighborhoods are more likely to experience a delay after abnormal screening. Indigenous populations are more likely to experience a delay after abnormal screening. So targeting recovery towards our uh, more disadvantaged members of the community is going to be terribly, terribly important. Now, I don't want to leave out BC. This is unpublished data. So uh, I, I would like you to treat it as kind of work in progress stuff. But these are the data for BC. And we had exactly the same type of dip in the curve, the Mariana Trench that you saw in Ontario. And this is common in many, many jurisdictions. Uh, we have a whole bunch of modeling work going on right now. Uh, we had an almost 80 to 100% test reductions during the first wave. Um, and all kinds of data that we're trying to um, model currently about the knock-on effects of, of closing down screening for that two or three month period. And again, this is just American data, the same dip. So the reaction, um, and rightly so in wave, wave one, was this kind of precautionary principle. Uh, we need to close down our screening programs while we get to grips with what is this unknown pathogen, how does it get transmitted? How do we minimize exposure uh, to, our, uh, to our populations? I draw a distinction between wave one and subsequent waves because by wave two, we knew a lot more about this pathogen uh, and the cancer systems were opening up screening again. I have heard anecdotally people in the cancer system saying, you know, when we get the next pandemic, whenever that might be, um, we can't really afford to shut down the screening programs in the way we did this time around because of the knock-on effects. Uh, and I think we're gonna be debating that for a long time. Let's move on to treatment. 
Um, and I'm going to start here. There's been a couple of great papers by Kathleen Decker out of Manitoba talking about treatment and diagnosis and the impact there. Um, this is looking at the impact of COVID-19 on new cancer diagnosis and oncology care in Manitoba. Um, and you can see here on the left-hand side is the number of cancer surgical resections, and they drop off dramatically uh, with quite severe restrictions on operating rooms in Manitoba in the first wave in particular. But you can see a, a better picture on the uh, right-hand side where the number of uh, intravenous chemotherapy visits seems to be pretty much tracking with what you might expect. But the treatment data is more difficult to unpack. Um, and I know that colleagues in Ontario and various other provinces are working on this right now. Um, this is an international survey of 343 oncologists from 28 different countries. And they were asking, this is very early on in the, the pandemic, whether they changed their protocols for chemotherapy. Um, and there were reports from, or whether, sorry, whether they would change their protocols. And there are reports from different oncologists that the answer was they would be willing to change protocols um, in the face of the pandemic, maybe switching to more oral chemotherapies to keep people out of the cancer centers, uh, maybe to uh, look at toxicity in a slightly different way. Um, so we had some ideas from survey-based work about intentions about what physicians might do. I hear a lot of anecdotal evidence at the moment, but I haven't seen um, a huge amount yet of empirical work. There is some starting to come out. What has been the impact of COVID-19 on treatment protocols? Um, and I think that will take us again a while to unpack what actually happened. We know that surgical systems are very fragile to lockdowns. Uh, I, I heard one of our patient partners the other day saying, I didn't realize before the pandemic that we could talk about cancer surgery being elective or non-elective. And I thought that was a really fascinating question. Uh, at what point is cancer surgery elective? And, and their argument as a cancer patient was, well, shouldn't cancer surgery always be non-elective? Um, but, you know, there's lots of things we can debate about that. Certainly, we saw in lots of jurisdictions discussions around prioritizing wait lists um, uh, and looking at risk. And obviously, there are more, there are some tumor types where surgery is, is more of a timing issue uh, because there are potentially worse outcomes if surgery isn't done in a timely fashion. But this study here, which came out in the JCO, um, looked at different countries, and some of these countries did a very nice job of creating COVID-19 free surgical pathways. So they managed to kind of, if you like, cordon off parts of their operating, their surgical pathways, so that they could uh, keep it COVID-19 free and keep those surgical suites operating um, uh, and, and treat patients surgically through that process. So um, let's turn now to the impact of COVID-19 on cancer treatment in the US. Uh, and this is similar data to earlier, showing that 64 to 87% of patients with cancer reported delays in their planned surgery, eight to 45 days of delay in radiotherapy. And that's an interesting uh, number because as we get up to the 45 day boundary, that's quite a long delay in uh, initiating radiotherapy. Um, lots of other types of changes reported again in a survey format there. Now, I want to spend a, a little bit of time on this slide because this is really high quality evidence. And thanks to, to Tim Hammer, Hannah, who some of you know, in Ontario, uh, very timely um, systematic review and meta-analysis that he and colleagues published in the BMJ. And I want to kind of direct your attention to the bottom part of the slide here. And this is mortality increases as delay increases uh, in terms of treatment delay. And this is for breast cancer surgery delay for a thousand women. Um, the baseline here is 12% mortality. Uh, and you see here at the bottom, it says projected additional deaths due to delay. And I think this is the most telling part of the infographic here. Four weeks delay to treatment. 
you would expect an additional 10 deaths. Eight weeks, you would expect an additional 20 deaths. 12 weeks, 31. So it's a very neat linear increase in uh, mortality due to delays in treatment. What it shows you is, you know, increasing this delay in treatment, this gap to, to cancer surgery, is uh, has quite profound impacts on um, outcomes and particularly mortality. So that was great work there to help us understand what the impact of all these delays are, uh, potential delays are on patients. Uh, and I think this is the final part of the treatment that I'm going to talk about here. This is some work by Talia Malagon, who's part of the uh, Global Consortium. She's been doing some wonderful work modeling um, impacts on surgery, radiotherapy, chemotherapy, uh, uh, as well as hospitalizations and outcomes. And you can see here on the top diagram, there's a big drop off in surgery in particular and some radiotherapy and chemotherapy around the first wave. And then she's been modeling the impact of changes later on. Now, I, I quite want to kind of come back to this and I, I haven't spoken to her recently about what's going on right now. Um, I know in BC we are facing probably one of the bigger staffing shortages we've ever seen right now uh, and it's another knock-on effect of the COVID-19 pandemic and that is causing us again to think about uh, potential delays in treatment to our patients but this time it's coming from challenges around actually are finding appropriate staffing levels. So there's more work yet to be done about the impacts. I don't think this is going to go away anytime soon. Um, so some really challenging problems we've got. And the bottom graph there, we've got the number of COVID-19 hospitalizations, which tracks exactly as you would expect with the different waves of uh, COVID-19 that we're experiencing. And here's, um, here's a really telling slide that she's prepared. Um, it looks at the cancer incidence modeled on one side and shows a big dip in cancer incidence because we shut down our screening and, and a lot of our diagnostic services or had a drop off, then a big increase. And we're right in the thick of that now. And, and I think we're all aware that we've got a, a, a big bolus, if you like, coming through of new incident cases from this, this delay in diagnosis and screening. And then she's modeled the impact on cancer deaths in the longer term of this kind of delay that we've introduced into the system because of the pandemic. And she's done published some really neat work looking at what happens if you change your capacity uh, in terms of uh, the excess cancer deaths and, and the poorer outcomes over time. So the, the kind of medium gray color there is if we have zero treatment capacity change um, or if we have a 10% capacity decrease, which potentially is what we're facing now, or a 10% capacity increase. And this models the expected number of cancer deaths. And you can just kind of see the, the, the curve here uh, under different strategies. If we invest in capacity now somehow, and that's challenging in its own right, we can dampen down the effect, the negative impact on, on mortality. If we have a capacity decrease, which is potentially what we're really facing, we might have much more profound impacts on patient outcomes. So there's some data here, uh, and she's done some really nice work. Between 2020 and 2030, estimated there would be maybe 21,000 more cancer deaths, 2% increase in mortality, Assuming treatment capacities return to pre-pandemic levels in 2021. 2022, uh, under the modeling scenarios, is going to be the worst with a, a large jump, a 6% jump in mortality. But this can be mitigated depending on the approach that we take uh, in terms of capacity. The last part of the talk today is really going to be quite quick in terms of uh, highlighting a few things that are ongoing. Uh, the CCTG has asked working with them uh, on the impact of COVID-19 on Canadians living with cancer. They have a large cohort study that's underway presently. Um, Helen, who was kind enough to introduce me, has been leading some work on cancer patients' experiences with virtual health before and during the COVID-19 pandemic. And of course, virtual health has really taken off in, in a new way during the pandemic. 
Uh, BC is not dissimilar to many other parts of um, uh, Canada. Um, virtual health really is telephone visits for a lot of people. Um, there are all kinds of different impacts in different communities. Telephone is still the best way to reach lots of different people, but we're obviously in the process of rethinking what it means. Uh, and there are members of the community that are still hard to reach even with phone, and there's certainly challenges for some members of the community using Zoom or internet access and things like that, rural, remote communities, uh, more elderly populations. But this just gives you a flavor, uh, and we had this huge changeover almost overnight. I mean, it really was over that weekend around March 18, 19, 20, where we moved over to telephone and video visits. And some of the work that, that Helen and the team have produced so far has just been published. Um, higher scores for mental health are associated with better patient experiences with virtual health and a preference to use virtual health in the future. Um, it, one of the interesting findings we had out of this was the ease of the use on the first visit by virtual health is a really key predictor of whether people want to keep using that modality for consultations in the future. So you, there's a lot of emphasis on, on finding the right approach first time around. Um, and there's all kinds of different things we found around uh, gender and sex, location and, and education around preferences to use this in, in the uh, future. And I think one of the messages we're getting quite clearly is virtual health works well for some people, doesn't work so well for some other people, and we need to have a nuanced approach to how we use it in the future. So here are my very tentative lessons learned, and I have to be very tentative here because it's going to take years to unpack some of this. The first part goes back to my original training as a health economist, which is in the middle of the pandemic, we lost sight of lots of issues to do with health economics and value and what we were doing. Um, and one of my colleagues, Craig Mitten, produced this slide, and it's great, said there were trade-offs everywhere. We were making all kinds of decisions where we dedicated resources in one way, and that had massive knock-on implications to a bunch of other things in the health system. All kinds of trade-offs, particularly around wave one, wave two, wave three, these kind of dropped off the horizon and weren't, weren't well considered. And I would argue after wave one, it was kind of important that we need to look at these trade-offs. There are principles around opportunity cost in particular that I find very important to all of this. So this is just a diagram of the waves as we go through. The reason I put this in, um, I very much support the notion of using the precautionary principle for wave one, but I think we might have some reflections to make in later waves where you know minimizing risk as much as we possibly could by shutting down parts of the health system later on may not have been the most appropriate uh, way to be dealing with the pandemic because we had much more information at that point and we had trade-offs that we need to finally balance. And here's a bunch of papers uh, that I'm gonna put up there that talked about the ethics and economics uh, of dealing with COVID-19. And I think we really have been kind of muddling through uh, in a crisis situation, but we've got lots of reflections and lessons we need to learn. Um, and, and I've even put up some of the global implications here around the nature of vaccines as, glo as global public goods uh, and the need to consider vaccine allocation uh, more carefully in the future. But let's return to the cancer. And this is my, my last couple of slides. Um, we need to flatten the cancer incidence curve. And we've had a few slides already talking about this. Here's a neat study that came out of the global group again uh, uh, around colorectal screening. Results indicate that dis disruption to screening programs will have a substantial effect on the absolute number of colorectal cancer deaths between 20 and 2050. Uh, and the global group uh, had three sets of models here. You've got two models for the Netherlands, one for Australia, Onkosim, which is the CPAC model, uh, which is the one of direct interest to us. Uh, this is similar to what Talia's done in her modeling. Um, the black line here over time is the base case of um, no catch up in colorectal screening and what will happen to the number of deaths uh, for our colorectal patients. If we have immediate catch ups and a kind of aggressive about trying to catch up with our screening, 
the blue line, we kind of mitigate, we dampen the incidence curves, uh, or we might have a delayed modeling catch up there that they put in there. But the basic message is we're going to have a big increase in mortality. We can mitigate some of that, but it depends on our policy decisions as we go forward. Speaking to that point, the approach that we need to use needs to be quite nuanced, and I'm not sure that this is going to happen. Um, this is uh, another paper on cervical screening. Um, we found some clear evidence from all the studies so far that age is a good way to prioritize catch up in cervical cancer screening. So deprioritize women in age groups in which risk of cancer from missed screens is low, particularly that would be the elderly, for example. Um, previous screen history could be a risk selection criterion, uh, as can HPV vaccination status. The main message of this paper was, if you do good risk selection for cervical cancer screening catch up, you will mitigate the risks to, uh, to our, our potential population and reduce the amount of uh, adverse health outcomes. And there are many, many more things we can, we can learn out of this. We think that we've got some good evidence that suggests mail out for fit for colorectal screening is, uh, uh, is a really good way forward. Colonoscopy capacity is just a dreadful issue in Canada, I find. Uh, there's still real capacity problems in most provinces with colonoscopy. Um, there may be opportunities for greater use of self-collection for HPV testing. I'm a strong advocate for psychosocial care, which I think has been very poorly done in cancer for many, many years. Um, and then we have all kinds of uh, developments that we might get. There might be some bonuses out of this that as we repurpose COVID-19, um, some of the reagents and platforms are, are common to HPV testing. This may actually help the rollout of HPV testing, um, but that, that's to be determined. So I'm not sure how I'm doing the time. Oh, I'm not too bad. Um, I'm just going to turn it over for questions.